artificial intelligence. It's not got a very good rep nowadays. Just last week, or was it um, last month, Elon Musk said that artificial intelligence is possibly the biggest risk that we face as a civilization. When you think of a risk to you coming from artificial intelligence, many of you who have seen Hollywood movies would think there are robots rising. Or maybe those who have kept up with technology, you think that your phone or maybe your car which is driving itself, is going to turn itself against you? Well, from where I stand, it seems that the one machine that we rely on the most is already increasingly turning itself against us. The one machine, our brain, that we rely on through which we see everything, perceive everything, has been slowly but surely through our thoughts, through our emotions, through the chemicals, becoming the largest killer of young men in our country today, and one of the largest killers across the world. We look at artificial intelligence with a lot of fear, but we tend to turn away from statistics such as these because they make us uncomfortable. I wouldn't have known that 800,000 people committed suicide in 2015, and that it is taking away our young men, one at a time, 70% men, 30% women, commit suicide. Until in 2014, towards the end of the year, one of those young men was Sagar. Sagar was a 20-year-old young man, the most alive person that I had ever seen, a drummer, a linguist, um, going forward and traveling the world, uh, finding his passion, igniting everybody else with it. He was this person, he was not our child, but my husband and I have a 17-year-old son now. He was the person that we wished our son would grow up to be. A few months after his 20th birthday, struggling with bipolar disorder that had been just diagnosed a few months ago, he jumped in front of a train and committed suicide. It made us think, at that time, Ramakant, my husband, and I were trying to change the world in places like Iraq and Yemen, trying to address conflict outside. And it made us think about things back home. It made us think about the dangers inside our own heads, in our, inside our own homes, inside our own lives. And we began to realize that one in four people experience mental illness every year. In this room, one in four of you have experienced mental illness in the last one year. I won't ask you who they are, but I'll ask you how many of them, how many of you have seen a psychologist or a therapist or a, a psychiatrist in the last one year? A show of hands, please. I see very few, much fewer than the numbers who would have experienced mental illness. And that's quite normal for India. The reason is that only one in 10 people get treatment. 90% of the people who are suffering from mental illness will go untreated in India. It's not surprising. We have one therapist or psychologist or psychiatrist for every 250,000 people in our country. So we can see that there is a problem and it's bubbling under the surface that at some level, our young men and women, all of us are drowning and is there a way for us to detect what's happening well in advance of somebody committing suicide? Get them help. People are not going to come out and talk about it. Three-fourths of the people that have a mental illness believe that if they tell somebody about it, they're not going to be sympathetic or caring. So we said, could we use technology? We're technologists. And it turns out that it's possible for technology to become emotionally intelligent. Emotional intelligence is really about knowing a person's emotions or an emotional state before they're able to tell you. And if you can detect it and respond appropriately, we would call you emotionally intelligent. So we found out that actually all of us have biorhythms, and these biorhythms are very often mimicked by our smartphones because we carry our phones around with us all the time. 
And as we carry our phones around, their sensors pick up our biorhythms. And if we apply artificial intelligence and machine learning to this, we can actually detect whether somebody's depressed. A lot of this work was happening in places like Harvard and MIT. So we said, can we take it to a very different place? And we took it to Aurangabad, Maharashtra, in a clinic of people with diabetes. They had people from about 300 kilometers around them. And therefore, there was a wide variety of people, people who had very entry-level smartphones, a $25 smartphone, um, people who, had, um, who were older, who had normal your iPhones. So we took all of these people, and we went and gave them our technology. And we found that we could detect depression to a 90% accuracy. In the group, 30 people had depression as assessed by a psychologist. 27 were accurately detected by AI. And we were really thrilled. We said, oh, wow, we've cracked it. We found a technology that can be the answer. You know, we were like, oh, man. And then we followed up three months later, and we found out that one person of those detected had actually received treatment. What does that tell us? It tells us, one, that the world is on fire. It was very clear to us that so many people are suffering. And that we've got a very accurate way of creating a fire alarm. You can find out where somebody is actually going to have a big issue. But there is no brigade coming. There is nobody here to help. So we began to wonder whether we turn to artificial intelligence yet again, where humans are letting us down, and say, can we actually train it to provide emotional support? Now, when you provide emotional support, what do you do? If, if you're upset and I have to talk to you, the first thing I'll do is I'll understand how you're feeling. So to some extent, our technology was already doing that. It was understanding that this person is depressed. Now, from there, I have to actually talk to you and understand how you're feeling. So there are three things that when we listen, we can tune in, typically, to what you're saying the content of what you're saying, the emotion behind what you're saying, or how what you're saying is making me feel. And when we humans talk, we very often react from a point of how what you're saying is making me feel. Well, artificial intelligence doesn't have that problem because it doesn't feel. But when it has to detect, it's actually quite good at detecting emotions behind what somebody's saying. It's quite hard for it to understand the full context of human beings. But it's not so bad at detecting how are you feeling in what you're saying? So we started there. And we said, OK, that's an easy one. Emotional support, based on what you're talking, it will understand what you're saying. But then I change my posture. I look with open eyes. I open my arms. I put an arm around you. That's emotional support. How does artificial intelligence do that? So we played around with a few user interface designers. And we said, OK, there's a little pocket penguin. Looks cute. There's little GIFs that are hand-drawn. We found the kind of artistic style that makes people feel compassion. And that was still not that difficult to crack. So we were able to create Wiser the pocket penguin that would be in your phone, chat with you, and show you little GIFs, and you'd feel a bit happier. The big thing, really, was to figure out what to say. Now, I'm a problem solver. So my natural instinct, in fact, uh, one of my closest friends would tell me when she wanted me to help her would be, I'm going to tell you everything that's wrong with my life, and I don't want you to solve the problem. Because my natural instinct, and many of ours, is to solve the problem. So we went into this and said, we've detected the emotional state. We've given them a nice gif. Now what are they waiting for? Let's tell them what to do. We gave them evidence-based therapy. We gave them breathing techniques. We gave them how to change your thoughts, how to make people look at things differently. We turned all of that into little modules which they could talk to. We thought, awesome. Turns out that while all of those things work, and there are lots of journal articles that show they do, what really people want to do is just be heard. And they want somebody to listen to them empathetically. How do you do that? We played around. And we found that empathy is not a trait. It's not something that I am born with. 
It is something that you can deconstruct. Over three million conversations, we give many, many different responses to people. And we train the AI to figure out which one was working better and which one was working worse. And we found something very interesting. We found that the most empathic response for a person to give is not a statement. It is almost always a question. It is almost always that you have to first ask how somebody's feeling. Then once you know how they're feeling, you acknowledge how they're feeling. You don't try to change their state. And then you ask another question and another question. Open-ended questions that allow people to express how they're feeling and not feel alone in how they're feeling. It turns out that people will face almost anything as long as they don't feel that they're alone facing it. So 3 million conversations, 75,000 users, we think we're doing really great, but we're still wondering, are we emotionally connecting? Users started writing back to us. And the first thing that we heard, which made us feel um, that, yes, this is working, were people writing with such emotional uh, content, saying, I cried because of this. I, I love Visa. There's a strange emotional connect that people are doing with a piece of technology, and not even something that is you know, able to drive itself like a car. This is a chatbot. They're chatting with it, and they're feeling emotionally connected with another person. We were very happy, but there was one day that changed our lives completely, and that was May 29th. On May 29th, we got this mail. There was a 13-year-old girl who wrote to us and said, Wiza was the only thing helping her hold on to life. I still can't get my head around it. I still can't get my head around the fact that there's a 13-year-old girl somewhere. We don't know where she is. We don't know her name. Who hasn't felt comfortable talking to her family, who hasn't felt able to get therapy, but she has been able to talk to a little penguin that lives in her phone. And that penguin, an AI bot, a piece of technology, is helping her hold on to life. It says something about AI and its possibilities, but I think it says much, much more about us as humans. And my question to you today, really, is not so much about whether AI can be compassionate. My question to you very much more is about the fact that if AI can be trained to be compassionate, if compassion can be broken down into a series of steps and a bot can learn to do it, when are we as humans going to step up and learn to be compassionate? Where three out of four people with mental health issues feel that they'll turn to the person next to them and that person is going to judge them and not treat them with sympathy and caring and the response is not going to help. When are we going to turn up as humans and reclaim our humanity and our compassion and say, yes, if Visa can do this, then let me at least try to be better at the one thing that makes me human than an artificially intelligent bot.